Hey guys, Andrew here from Caught Offside. And before you listen to today's podcast, we just wanted to give you a heads up that full disclosure, this was recorded prior to the news about Cristiano Ronaldo wanting to leave Real Madrid over his tax evasion case came out. So I did want to just get that out there for you so you're not confused as to why you're listening to a soccer podcast that is not mentioning what is probably the biggest story of the day. Obviously, we're going to talk a lot about this in our podcast next week. Uh, Right now, the questions are just how serious he is about this claim. There's an article that I suggest you all read at ESPN FC by Sam Marsden, where he goes through some of the possibilities as to why this could be happening and how this is going to play out. Check that out because it details it pretty nicely. There are some people out there who think this could just be a ploy by Ronaldo to try to get more money from Real Madrid. That is really difficult for me to believe. He's currently, I think Forbes just named him last week as the highest paid athlete on planet Earth. He's making something like 400,000 uh, euros a week, over 82.5 million euros a year. Uh, so I don't see this, even with all the success he's brought Real Madrid recently, I, I don't see this as a ploy for him to try to bilk them for more money. Honestly, I really believe that this is just a guy who is probably incredibly frustrated with what his current situation is legally with the Spanish government, who is just speaking out of emotion. Uh, he's probably nervous about how this is going to play out. Um, and this, in his mind, probably makes sense. I just want to get out of here. I'm so bitter that they're treating me this way, that they're making an example of me, which is apparently how he feels about this situation. So I do believe that in the moment, this isn't some. there's not some deeper meaning here. I don't think that that's true. I really think that it's just a guy who's a little bit nervous and is speaking out of emotion right now. My guess is that cooler heads will prevail, and at some point he will just go back to Real Madrid and will just carry on. Uh, but right now, I do believe that he's serious Will other clubs try to approach Real Madrid and see what they can get for Ronaldo? Who knows? I I would say any club that has money, like Manchester United or even PSG, uh, clubs like that, they'd probably be stupid not to. I mean, do your due diligence if this guy is saying he wants to leave. But personally, I'd be really surprised if it played out any other way than him remaining with Real Madrid once this is all uh, settled and done with. But that's just brief thoughts on this right now. Like I said, we'll get a lot more into it next week as more details kind of come out on this. But when the arguably most popular player on in the world makes a comment like this, we felt we did need to say at least something about it so you're not listening to this podcast waiting for when that mention will come. That's all for now. Enjoy the rest of the show. Caught Offside with Andrew Gunling and J.J. Devaney. Oh, yes. Caught Offside from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. It's Andrew Gunling and J.J. Devaney. What's up, brother? Hey, brother. How are you? I'm doing well. Very happy to be here with you. Back-to-back podcast days. It's a joy. It is a joy. I love spending time with you. I know. Hopefully everybody got a chance to listen to our podcast that we put out last night. Alexi Lalas was on talking all things U.S. men's national team. He sounded pretty chipper. Yeah, he really did. He really did. He had fun down in Mexico. Rob Stone sounds like he ran amok. Let's yeah, be honest. He Just sounds a- like a real foodie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did Alexi say last night on the podcast that, uh, he, that Christian Pulisic could lead this team to a World Cup? I think That's that, a big statement. I, I think that he might have. That's a big well, we're, you, We we're, thought we loved him. Well, we put out the alternative fact that he said they're going to win one with him. That's that's pretty awesome. 2026 when it's here, I think. Put it in the books. <laughs> there you go. Uh, this should be a fun podcast coming up. Obviously, a couple little newsy bits that we want to put out there, but this is mainly a podcast that is all about you, the people, and what a response we got from you, the people, when we put out there on Twitter – we're doing a special, a mailbag special, where we're just taking questions and comments on, on anything. And uh, you guys really stepped up, and we got some great ones. So we'll run through all of those. A lot of football, but some of course, some life questions that, mixed in. I mean, it is a football soccer podcast. I, I know, but... I expect that to be the bulk of the questions. But me and you are, so we've got so many strings to our bowl. We're very worldly. I was thinking we should do a music and culture pod sometime. Yeah, okay. Because I do feel like... I'll tell you what, I was watching the documentary about the class of 92, about that great Manchester United youth team that went on to be the, 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 you know, the real crew behind the 99 win, yeah. uh, treble win. And um, they were talking about uh, Manchester at that time was exploding with music, and they said, there's football and there's music, and that's about it. And I was like, yeah, that's still about applies. it. It still applies. It still applies. It's the most important thing. And yeah. they kind of, 
they gel together. So maybe we could do that sometime. Okay, cool. Uh, and then, of course, Red Cards, Man of the Match. You are Mr. Chipper, and so a few times now you've had double Man of the Matches and for, foregone your Red Card. Uh, I, of course, go the other direction. Now, I still have a Man of the Match, but I do have two Red Cards. Um one of which made me really like, – they both are bad, but one of them, I don't know. Well, you know what? They're both really bad. I'll leave it at that. Well, I went back to the tried and tested. I have a red card and I have a man of the match. So yeah, You mean the normal way? Normal. I'm not normal. normal. Let's be honest. Neither are you. We wouldn't be doing no, this. No, that's a good point. News and notes. We, a couple things before we get to your mail. I guess it's worth starting out with Everton. Really busy uh, in the recent transfer window here. Couple big signings for them. Uh, Davy Clausen coming over from Ajax, twenty-three and a half million pounds, and Jordan Pickford, of course, coming from Sunderland on twenty-five million pounds. That could rise to thirty, depending on if he reaches certain benchmarks and so on. Um, what do you make of these? Clausen has had a very good Europa League from from watching him, and I don't know an awful lot about him, but from what I've seen, I like it. Straight away, I've seen people, including Sky Sports, don't want to call them out, but they've done the Klassen versus Barkley comparison. Uh, both attacking midfielders. Yeah, and they did you know goals last season. Klassen had 14, Barkley only had 5. Shot conversion, 25%, 6%. Uh, chances created, Klassen 57. Um, Barkley... 82, according in, in fewer games, though, right? The Dutch Eredivisie doesn't play the same number of games that they play in the Premier League. Yeah, so straight away you're doing this kind of... It's a little hard to compare. Uh, well, we've seen before that the Eredivisie and the Premier League are, are not comparable in, man, in many respects. No, but, some, but in Europe, Klassen has been good. It's hit or miss. We see some guys come over from the Eredivisie, and they're they're great pretty much right away. I mean, look, I'll give you the Tottenham fan perspective. I saw Christian Eriksen come over right away, and he was fantastic. Um, I saw Ricky van Mulswinkel come over, and he wasn't. So you don't know. It's a, it's a case. Every case is kind of its own case. But yeah, I, I mean, Klassen seems like a good player from what I've seen. I need to see more of him to make a real educated opinion. Pickford, yeah. we've seen a lot of. And it seems like a lot of money. Yeah, and that's not an indictment of him. No. I, I really do think that he can be a, a great goalkeeper in this league. I just sometimes wonder about that allocation of money, spending that much on that position. I, I just don't know if I would always go that route. Well, how about I put this to you? If you were to look at the defensive unit, goalkeeper and back four or five, whatever you want to say for uh, Everton, where would you say the greatest need was? The back four, their, their defense. Center back, uh -huh. definitely full back because Seamus Coleman ain't going to be back anytime soon. But certainly center back where they've got aging center backs. Right. I would, I would have just... I'm not saying you don't need a good goalkeeper. Of course you do. Now, Everton fans are over the moon about getting Pickford up. Uh, it's going to be, I think, initially 25 million going up to... 30, thir potentially. 30. Yeah. So that puts him third on the list of most expensive goalkeepers of all time. Yeah, Edson exactly. is number one, Gianluigi Buffon, and then uh, Pickford. Yeah. I, and I was the guy, when people were asking me, what should Pickford do? I was like, well, it probably won't be up to him because Sunderland need the money, so he'll be probably sold. But if I was Pickford, I wouldn't mind a year in the championship, a season in the championship, maybe to season him as a goalkeeper. But maybe That's he's not had what that. He wants. Maybe he's had that already. He, well, I don't know what he wants. Enough. How do you he's know what he wants? He's good enough to be playing. In the, I, I, Starting, how do I know what he wants? Jordan, would you rather play in the championship this year or for Everton in the Premier League? I think I know what he wants. Come on. It's ridiculous. Easy there, Minoraiola. Are you his agent right now? <laughs> um, yeah. I, if I'm an Everton fan, look, we can say what we want about the Pickford move, but I think Everton supporters have every right to be excited about this because their club, uh, over the past few years, they've kind of been on the cusp. They've looked at that top six, and I think there's some, you know, why can't we be among that group? They don't typically spend a ton of money in transfer windows. They've been content with what they've had. They, you know, I guess I shouldn't totally say that. Yannick Bellassi was a pretty big move. Um, you know, but by and large, I think we look at them and say some of the smaller moves are, are what they go for. The Aaron Lennons, things like that. Uh, they're making, they're coming right out of the gate in this transfer window, and they're making a statement that they want to try. They recognize that they are not among that top six. I think they recognize they want to be. And and these, I don't know if these moves will put them over the top. In fact, I would say they probably won't because I think these moves are only happening because they know they're losing Romelu Lukaku. Uh, and with Clausen coming in, I don't know what that means for Ross Barkley. Um, but 
like I said, Belasi will be back. You put in these two guys. The Lukaku money is going to be massive. So there's still room for them to make other purchases. I like Ronald Koeman reshaping the squad in his image to what he wants it to be rather than just going forth with the inherited squad that he had. So I like this a lot. I, there was no way he was going to stick with what he had. And right. I, I think he wanted to be backed. And, and just on Barkley, look, Klassen or no Klassen, Koeman said at the end of last season, he signs his contract, he stays, or he doesn't. And he goes. Yeah. Not much room for ambiguity there. No, not really. Uh, so that's Everton uh, at the moment. Coming back now to the U.S., Kyle Lahren found himself in a, a little bit of trouble with the law, arrested for a DUI in Orlando just a few miles from the stadium, about 2.30 in the morning um, the other night. He'll be assessed by the league's substance abuse and behavioral health program. He'd be ineligible to play until he's cleared and the league completes an investigation. Uh, this is what happened with, I think it was Marco Papa back uh, in 2015 with Seattle. Um, obviously, look, I don't need to run through Lawrence's credentials and what this could mean for Orlando City. I doubt he'll be out that long. Well, I, um, but eight goals this season, you know, probably their star player and their best player. Uh, so it's in a in a pretty good period of time for them. It's It's a black mark that was avoidable, completely avoidable. Well, firstly... Again, it's an athlete who has the institution and the systems and the help of a top club around him and why he's out. I have no problem with him being out, by the way. He wasn't on duty for Orlando. He wasn't on duty for Canada. Um, why he can't have, get a taxi? Why can't, If he's going to be imbibing, someone can't look after him properly? I don't understand that. And that's a worry... Um, I'm just happy nobody was killed. Well, that's he was going the down the, the the road the wrong direction. There's a right. There are a few notable parts to this DUI. He's dri- like you say. He's driving on the wrong side of the road, and it's not just him. He's got a passenger in the car with him. I mean, you're putting a you're putting a lot of lives in jeopardy when you're just behaving so recklessly. He gets pulled over. You and I we watched the video of his arrest on TMZ. He gets pulled over, and the police officer has to tell him. You know you're driving on the wrong side of the road. To which he responds with, oh, I was? Oh, well, I'm from Canada. What the hell does that have to do with absolutely anything? Ridiculous comment to he, being told you're driving on the wrong side of the road. He didn't sound 22. He sounded he sound like a 12-year-old the way he was talking. It was, I mean, it's, it's every bit of it on TMZ was just embarrassing. Yeah. So it's a bad look for him. There's no question about it. Um, but now, here's the thing. I, I was saying to you before, he's very lucky in some respects that he's, like, if I did this, I might be fired the next day. Is Does this affect him? And this is really a comment about all professional athletes, but does this affect Kyle Lahren in any way, shape, or form? No. No. If he's still scoring goals for Orlando City, he'll be welcome back. He'll be welcome back a hero by the end of the season. People will forget all about this. So that's just the nature of sports. Uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. You're hoping that he'll be taken in hand and harshly punished for this because, you know, it's the night that his team crashed out to a team from a lower division or from a different division in the U.S. Open Cup. We're easily beaten at home. He's in the club drinking. Bad luck. Bad luck all around. Uh, and then one other one here uh, that you mentioned to me about Harry Redknapp. Yeah. Wanting uh, John Terry to join him at Birmingham. <laughs> Is this not the most Redknapp thing of all time? Well, how so? Well, don't call him a wheeler or dealer because we know what happens if you call oh, him a wheeler or oh, dealer. No, that's, like that. that's not good. But um, it just seems like he's, he's, he's a player he would know of, a player he's probably been in the company of. He's a... Uh, He's always had a penchant for the uh, the kind of player in the, the sunset of his career, tried to get a few more drops of goodness out of him. Um, yeah, I saw with William Gallus, he brought him over on a free at Spurs. You know, things like that is yeah. is, is, is what he's done in the past. And um, I think Luis Saha was another one. And he signed, um, what was the New Zealand international he signed for Spurs in that window? Remember you did, it was the only bit of business you did. Oh, what was his name? Yeah, I remember he took. You he got came him, over from Blackburn, or yeah, you or, got him from Blackburn. Yeah, I don't remember the name now. In his mid thirties, clearly it didn't leave a lasting impact. Oh uh, well, I'll 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 look it up. But um, by the way, here's what happens when you call him a wheeler dealer. And you mean you've made your name as a wheeler and dealer? There's not no, been I'm much not wheeling really, and dealing, no, 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 I'm not a wheeler and dealer. <laughs> no.
Message received. Yeah, so. So, John Terry, uh, what do we think? Is this even remotely possible? Well, for a team that's. Uh, they struggled last season, and as I said, the, the championship is the demanding schedule. I think he'll struggle down there. <laughs> he hasn't played very much in the last season or no, so. No, hardly at all. I to guess be, to be thrown in there is, it's it's. I'm not saying it's the best standard league in the world, but it's a tough league in terms of the demands and the, how quick and fast the games come. Yeah, and for a guy who's well over the hill, I'd, I'd be concerned. Yeah, I guess we'll find out if he's not playing anymore because Chelsea just didn't want him, or because he truly is done playing. If this if this is about Chelsea not wanting him, then like I always say, you keep playing until you're do- until you want to be done. Uh, so if he goes there, Chelsea fans are going to probably be upset about it. Oh, I want to remember him as a Chelsea player. Look, your club didn't want him, so who are you to tell him that he should be finished because Chelsea no longer wanted his services? But that may not be. I my, don't want my to... guess is that it doesn't happen. Uh, it's, it's the same thing with Francesco Totti. I don't want to be the one to tell anyone that they shouldn't be playing, but at right. the same time, you just wonder about this move um, just purely by the physical nature of the league. Ryan Nelson. Oh, yes, thank you. That is correct. Just he, a weird he left, signing. He left no impact whatsoever. It was he was like the only signing in that window. I think. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. So there you go. Mailbag time. It's a big, heavy, heavy mailbag at CO Soccer Pod. Uh, catch us on email, caughtoffsidepod at gmail.com. I think we have an Instagram account. I, I'm not very good with oh, these I, things. I, I, I rarely use it properly. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. If you're not following us on Twitter, I'm going to come to your house and cause a disturbance. Uh, we'll start with Twitter. Alfredo Escandon, at Mr. Saucy. Is Donnarumma a fool to leave Milan after the summer of transfers they're having? So AC Milan under new ownership, and today it was announced that Donnarumma won't be extending his contract with the club and technically will be up for for purchase by whatever suitor wants him. Well, he, yeah, he has a year left on his contract, but he said, he, like you say, he's not going to renew it. So essentially this is the time now for AC Milan to benefit in some way. And he's so young, and he's viewed as one of the best in the world. And he really is an amazing goalkeeper if, you, if you've watched him. He's so big. I mean, you, when you see him in the goal, he just fills the goal out. And uh, he, he was particularly impressive last season. Um, and he's got Mino Raiola as his agent. So Boy, that guy... He's a, a titan in the sport. If we made a list of like the most important people in soccer, I wonder where we would have to put Mino Raiola on that list. He's right up there. With, he's right up there with George Mendes, the other super agent. These pe- these guys have uh, the connections now. Infantino, and... Messi, Raiola. Why not? <laughs> if you can command where the best players go and where they play yeah. their trade in in what league, surely you have a uh, you know kingmaker status. So is he a fool to leave Milan? Uh, Look, Milan is a project that uh, they just recently bought Andre Silva, the Port- you know the, the the Portuguese footballer. So they're all excited about that. This is Milan Mark II, and they're going to be a new power and a new strength. But can he really wait around when there's going to be huge offers on the table? He's ready to play in the Champions League now, right? Essentially, at eighteen gonna... years of age, and even with the moves that AC Milan are making, are they better than Juve? Straight out, of, uh, no. I don't know, I mean, and. You know, we're talking about in terms of his future. We're talking about clubs like Real Madrid, Manchester United, PSG, um, even potentially Juve. Although we just expect loyalty from the younger players straight away. We kind of do and ply their trade and earn blah blah blah. But look, he already has what he made his debut at sixteen. He has already what three, two, two and a half seasons of of experience. Maybe, maybe he's ahead of the curve and he wants to move. And, and why should he be denied that? Also, maybe Real Madrid want him. Maybe right. he fills a spot there. Uh, as uh, as to Kreider at the Real Bamonte, has the gesticulating and aggressive motions by the players gone too far? Every foul there is someone complaining and in the ref's face or another player's face. I'm surprised there hadn't been more actual fights or more incidents like the Chelsea v City match last season. Thoughts? Uh, yes, it has gone too far now. But the Premier League addressed it at right, the start of last season, right? And then I just don't know if they stuck with it. Like it, yeah, they came it out, seemed to tail off. They came out very strong in the beginning of the year, and guys were getting yellow cards very easily for, for dissent. dissent. Yeah. Um, and then I think they had hoped that okay, we made our point, and now maybe this will just settle in. It's going to take a while. It's just become part of sports culture. No one. Uh, we were just watching the NBA Finals. JJ, incredible fat. Like 
blatantly obvious fouls are occurring in these games. And guys are still throwing their arms up. In the, what are you talking about? Not a foul. We see the same thing in soccer all the time. No one in their own mind has ever committed a foul. And it does get obnoxious to watch. Yeah, it's gone too far. By the way, Marco Van Basten, who is the, I don't know, the rules czar, he is called for fair play in the Confederations Cup. And there's a directive gone to referees in the Confederations Cup to stop the crowding of referees on major incidents. Again, we had thought this was all ha- How, having been Marco, addressed. How, Are you going to come on with a stick? Get away! Well, no, you, you card these guys. If they do this, you just hit, start throwing around yellow cards. Yeah, and cards. then there's another appeal and another appeal. It's got, like you say, it's going to take time. And, and you've got to follow it through. And I don't think that happened in the Premier League. No. By the way, it'll be interesting at this Confederations Cup with the uh, VAR technology in use. This is kind of a dry run. It will be. We've seen little bits and pieces of it at the... Um, uh, Stade de France for yeah. their friendly game so we'll see what it's going to be like over the course of a tournament Spencer Ratfield if you were starting a new club do you go with England to reach the Premier League eventually or the US to go straight into the MLS what so, does he mean start as so I guess like he's a, pretending that we're billionaires or, or multi-millionaires we've got enough money do we go and start a new club with in, in England uh, to reach the Premier League eventually to climb the ladder or do you go to the US and go straight into the MLS well for, if you'd go to England there's no guarantee you're going anywhere. Uh, you just take making, years. Yeah, or maybe not ever. We talk about clubs that have gone decades, generations without reaching the Premier League. So that's a very risky investment if you want to start by grabbing a team in the, fourth, you want. in the fourth division. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The buy-in in MLS is probably, well, I don't know. If you pick up a fourth division team, it's probably also incredibly cheap. I don't know. That's a, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry. It's a tough one. I, I, would, I would go to England. And I would rise right all the way up to the top like Wimbledon. Call sign, Ma- uh, call sign Maverick at Jake Thielbar. What does the MLS have to do to become a more legitimate league? Question mark. Some people say teams should sell their best players. What do you guys think? What does that mean? I don't know. Some people say teams should sell their best players. What, so Toronto should sell Javinko? Who's that helping? No, I don't know if I quite am reading that right. No. Well, that's what, as it's written. Okay. What? Well, well, we'll answer, not, let's that, just answer the first part then. What does the MLS have to do to become a more legitimate league? Boy, that's a big question. I guess I do. Their problem is twofold. Obviously, uh, the first thing that I look at is the strategy of signing old players who are done in Europe. Um, and that's kind of being eased help, off. It might help attendance figures. It might help TV ratings, although I don't know that it does. But does it help the perception of the league no. worldwide? Not really. Now, sometimes it's a little bit unfair, though. People, David Villa does not count as one of those guys. He was st- when he came to MLS. What was he? Thirty-one, coming off a season where he had just played in a Champions League final for Atletico Madrid. He could have continued playing in Europe if he wanted to. And he has been brilliant since he came here. Right. He's put it in. He scored the goals. He's league MVP. I mean, I think the guys that we're talking about, you know, Gerard, um, would Zlatan count? Yes, ta- I, especially after the injury. But look what he just did He's, for Manchester United. Uh, he can still clearly that's, play. That's, that's he going can to be, play with the world's elite. Yeah, but by the time he's back, that's going to if he signs for LAFC. Yeah, I don't know. Look, it's a very it's a tricky problem. They're on the right track in that um, maybe it's not great for the development of young American players, but you're seeing more American players stay here or come back here while they're still in their primes when that wasn't necessarily the case a decade ago. Europe was the place to go, you know, regardless of what league it was, the Dutch league, Norwegian league, wherever. You're seeing those guys now choose America over some of those other leagues. So I think that does help in terms of credibility. When casual U.S. soccer fans see Josie Altidore and they say, who does he play for in Europe? And then somebody can say, no, 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 he, he plays in MLS. That, that probably helps. But if you're looking for one big answer as to what can boost the credibility, there's, there's no magic elixir for this. It's going to take generations for this change to occur. Brian McGuigan, favorite Irish athlete, that's for me. So that'd be Roy Keane. If I was to take another discipline right now, it would be Carl Frampton in boxing. Love that guy. Wow. Yeah. I've never even heard you mention him. I, I mentioned it. You, the amount You've of times never I even say said his things, name. the amount of times I say things to you and you just, you know, completely just don't listen to me. I thought you were talking about Peter Frampton. <laughs> what band was he in? Peter and the Framptons. Oh, he was a guitarist, wasn't he? Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, he played like a weird-sounding guitar. 
Right. Well, Cara Frampton. Okay. Do I get an answer for my favorite Irish athlete? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Who would my favorite Irish athlete? I don't know. Robbie Keane would probably be uh, Spurs. Okay. Yeah. Can I give you my American answer? Please. Alan Iverson. With Brian Dawkins in a, in second, but it's a it's a distant kind of a distant second. I I can't think of my favorite American athlete. Really? Mm. There's no I don't know. You're a big giant fan and Met fan. I don't know. I mean, like to you can't to, even muster up any name. To narrow it down to one is is really tough for me. I think I mean watching the Giants over the last few years. I love Eli, but sometimes when I hear the word athlete and Eli. <laughs> And I see the way he runs. Oh, he's a quarterback. That yeah. counts. Yeah. I mean, I disagree with it vehemently, but, you know, it counts. Yeah, let me think about that. I'm going to come back to that. Yeah, right. Uh, Jose Benitez, how do you guys feel about the Confederations Cup? Uh, Craig Burley hates it, but Gab, Mar- <laughs> but Gab Marcotti loves it. Love the pod, by the way. Does it have to Thank be you. hate or love? Can it be like or dislike? Like, I would say that I like it. Don't put words in Jose Benitez's mouth. But I don't love He's it. He's asked a question. I, I don't love it, and I don't hate it. I like you it. You feel it's, mad about it. I it's like it. It's fine. You know, I like it. It's something to get us through the summer. I think it's a tournament that has grown in prestige. I think in this country it matters a little bit more. Uh, than maybe it would for European nations or South American nations just because, you know, they the Gold Cup is not as much as we get into the Gold Cup, it's not Copa America, it's not the European Championship. So Confederations Cup for CONCACAF does mean something and we're in CONCACAF. So I would say that I like it. It's created some great moments that I can remember as a US fan with the Spain victory, the Egypt victory. Yeah, you always um, bang on about those. You bore people to death. With so, them. you know, I, I would say I like it. I understand why Craig Burley is coming from that perspective um you know it's a major tournament but germany's bringing a b squad obviously that's not a major that, tournament. that raises questions about the Stop tournament's saying credibility. Major it's tournament. probably the biggest tournament ever played bigger than the world <laughs> cup maybe um i don't know where do you, you you're not a huge you're it's not very fond fine. of it fine it's fine I can go decades without paying any attention to it. Uh, Tito Castillo. We just did a whole podcast previewing it. It's not Listen a whole. It was, most of it was talking to Alexi Lalas, and it was great, by the way. Tito Castillo. How sweet would a rival we, rivalry week in, be in EPL? All the derbies in a weekend. Yeah. I don't know. I don't want that. I kind of like them scattered a yeah. little bit because it's something to look forward to right. each week. If we got a, first of all, if they were it done, sounds forced. If they were done all in one weekend, you, you wouldn't. They'd be up against one another. You wouldn't be able to watch. Right. You wouldn't be able to. Wa- you'd have to pick one. Um, so I don't know. I kind of like them scattered. Where every weekend you feel like, oh, nice. You got you know. City and uh, and United this week. Oh, you can, Spurs and Arsenal. I don't know. I, I kind of uh, kind of enjoy it as is. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, Paul Davison, who is clearly uh, just trying to have a bit of fun with us. Will Spurs struggle at Wembley next season? And when will Liverpool be out of the title race? November or February? I'll give my answers now, and I'll let you go at it. Okay. Uh, will Spurs struggle at Wembley? Yes. <laughs> when will Liverpool be out of the title race? November or February? Uh, May. So. Wow. Is that you? You're such a homer. You cannot answer these questions with any credibility. They're going to be out of the ch- uh, championship in May with the championship trophy in Anfield. Uh, I'm going to say that I don't believe Spur. Uh, struggle is a relative term. Will Tottenham be runners up next season and in the title race until the final few weeks? I don't know that I can say that, but I still view them as a team that will qualify for Champions League, finish top four next year. Uh, so, no, I would say that I don't think they're going to struggle. I do think they can make the pitch if they want. Uh, a little bit smaller than what Wembley's pitch usually is if they did want to go that route. Um, But I just think they're a good team. I think they're just quality players on that team. And I think that ultimately good players can outweigh the the dimensions of a field. Okay. And Liverpool, I'll say uh, in the title race, I'll go, I'm not going to say February, but I'll say uh, late March maybe. All right. Maybe early April. Is it wrong for me to say... Or a bit cliche to say that, like Jackie Robinson. I never saw him play, but I love his story and reading about him. And is that that's too cliche as a favorite no, American I athlete? I mean, look. Okay, now now I look like a jerk. <laughs> Jackie Robinson should probably be everybody's favorite athlete. No, if you're, no, why do you have to do that? You had to go and make this very serious, and and you couldn't. Uh, you're right. I mean, yeah, that is probably the winning answer. <laughs> Was that have I morally bankrupt your answer? <laughs> that now? is the winning answer. Yes. A guy changed the face of sports in this country and culture in this country. So, yes, that is probably the right answer. Was that unfair? 
that was unfair. Well, how can I one up? Well, grow, your growing now? growing up, uh, Jordan was huge. Like Jordan was amazing. Michael Jordan was just. You told me something the, uh, that I couldn't believe. Yeah. That your brother was here visiting. Right. And you took him to a Yankees game. Correct. And he asked who Jeter was. Yeah. Now I know that baseball is not really an international sport. Correct. But I would think that the most famous, maybe the most famous athlete, it was him and LeBron James, basically in in America. I would think people in Europe would be aware of. Nah, he's not on that level. Derek Jeter? No. Okay, maybe baseball is just a little more... If you more... visited here, definitely. Here he was just an enormous. Maybe they got to know him f- from his cameo in The Other Guys. But apart from that, no. That's interesting. He but just Le- really isn't. Would your brother know LeBron? LeBron James? Yeah. Good question. So now I think so, so, so yeah. we're talking I think about... so, yeah. You no, he's a sports so. guy. I'm pretty sure he did because we watched a bit of the, the Cavs and Warriors. And I'm not around. a Yankees fan, but I just always thought that Jeter was, was on that level where maybe he wasn't the best baseball player, but all those titles for the Yankees, he was just so famous, dated all the, you know, every famous female celebrity, it seemed like. Mm. I'm just surprised that somebody wouldn't even know how to say his name properly. Plaxico Burris. I love Plaxico. So that's, so we go from Jackie Robinson <laughs> to a guy who put a gun in the waistband of his sweatpants Accident- and shot himself in, Accidentally. In a club. God, you're just... Didn't pay his taxes in New Jersey either. (laughs) What's next? Uh, Wade Mayerhofer. We've probably answered this, but unless we have any other thoughts on it, do you think... Do you guys think Jordan Pickford was a good signing considering what Everton paid for him? Yeah, I mean, we did talk about that a little bit before. uh, Look, it's good. Are they a better club today than they were yesterday because they brought this guy in? Yes. So if that's what you care about, then it was a good signing. But... If spending that money on a goalkeeper prevents them from being able to spend significant money on a center back, then I think you might have to reevaluate. We may never know the answer to that, but I think those are the two ways that you look at it. Robert, at Sunny SoCal, Rob, could any of you change a flat tire for your car, and have you ever done it in the past? No and no. Yes and yes. People are probably not surprised with either of those answers. But it was one of the first things my father properly taught me. No, my I think you have to rescind your man card if you can't change a tire. Is that fair? And I have no desire to learn either. Really? None whatsoever. I have a AAA membership. Oh, for, for you would call AAA out for something as could and have for for a flat tire. Yeah, I once got one. I was driving out east on Long Island and uh, got a flat tire. I had to pull. You over. had no clue what to do with the jack and the. Uh, I uh, poked it with a stick for a little bit, hoping that that would get the job. Come done. on, <laughs> but it didn't. Reinflate. <laughs> Seriously, oh, yeah, it is a true story. Yeah, wow. yeah. No, Thankfully, my- I was already married at the time. Amanda wasn't going to divorce me over that. It seemed like a petty thing. So uh, we live. We we move on. We move on. Carl Lewis. <laughs> Would you stop? Growing up, I really liked Carl Lewis. Just saying. <laughs> Michael Johnson too. He was a great athlete. Tremendous runner. Yeah, he ran with a very straight kind of gait. Uh, can I change mine to those uh, two guys who won uh, rowing at the Olympics last year? Yeah, the two the Sullivan brothers. Love those guys. Right. Phil Karras, do you guys watch any sports other than soccer? Did you catch any NHL playoffs or NBA playoffs or any regular season stuff? My answer to that would be name a sport. I watch it. You watch all of it. I'm not a big tennis guy. I'm not a big golf guy. But the team, Ditto. basketball, football, baseball, hockey, soccer... College basketball, college, and honestly, name a sport. I uh, yeah, love them all. Yeah, I didn't watch the NHL playoffs. I'm not a huge hockey guy, and the NBA playoffs. I devoured them last season, and this this season, I never felt like the Cavs were going to do it, and I it just it just didn't engage me in yeah. the same way. Yeah. Uh, Eric Wild, let's talk real. <laughs> oh, it's been real. Who is the dumbest hair in football? Man buns, die jobs. I can say it can all be ranked. Okay, I have two answers that come to mind. All right. I know that this podcast, we're going to end this podcast, and I'm going to think of someone else, and it's going to really bother me. But off the top of my head, uh, I don't love Marijuana Fellaini's hair. I don't mind the the fro, but I don't know. Something about his is a little clownish to me. Okay, um, bit Sancho Bob. And then my real one, and he did change it back, although I still don't like it, uh, when Hector Bellerin came out with the cornrows, I thought he looked ridiculous and... Uh, I believe I made a mention of that on that podcast. So he would be probably my winner. 
Yeah, I'm going to go retro on this, so you're going to have to get your Google machines out, guys, but it's, it's worth it. There was no call to have hair like this at any period. And it's not like, you know, there's a style. Like, for example, fashion style in the 80s, shoulder pads and a bubble perm. It was right. just a style that lots of people had. This was no style. Taribo West from Nigeria, he played for Inter Milan as well. Great soccer player. He had a haircut at the World Cup um, that can only be described as just hideous. Uh, Andrew's steadily Googling it right now. I mean, what is that? <laughs> it's just... Yeah, I wouldn't do it. Ugh. It's awful. And he had many different... He had a green once. He had it yellow when he was at Inter Milan. I think he went to Inter Milan. He had a, a blue and black beads in his hair. Just awful. He, and he couldn't pull it off. He just... It did not look good. So Taribo West is good. one to look up. And my other one would be... Ooh. Go to the 1970s and pick any bubble perm. 1970s, 1980s. Any of the perm soccer players playing in England. Do you have one in mind? Um, I'll go with Phil Thompson. Phil Thompson of Liverpool. You looking that up? Yeah, I know what he looks like now, but I can't say I can recall what he looked like with a bubble perm. Uh, but anyway, so... No, yeah, put there, it... There you see almost, it? Yeah, that's pretty How bad. How bad is that? That's pretty bad. Can you do me a favor, because really the name bad. escapes me. Type in uh, Leicester City 1970s comb over. You think that's all it takes? I, Leicester City 1970s comb over. There should be a guy with it. Comb over one word. Or maybe it was it Chelsea. Even... Was he Chelsea or Leicester, Leicester City? Oh, sweet mother of God. <laughs> uh, I see a guy here from Chelsea, John Dempsey. John Dempsey for Chelsea. That was it. It was oh the blue God. shirt. It, it, he looks like an Amish man. How bad is that one? That's pretty rough. And the fact I remember this stuff. And finally, actually, I meant for Leicester City. Look up uh, the aforementioned Frank Worthington. We've talked about him before. Yeah, guys, you need to see that. What about this for haircut? Uh, not my favorite, but I've seen worse. All right. I've definitely seen worse. Uh, all right. So you don't have anybody in today's that today's I, That I really think is objectionable and awful. Yeah. Probably if I thought about it a bit more, but those ones spring to mind straight away. That okay. they. I've, I've long wanted to deal with Teribor West and just say, what are you thinking? John Kahn, is the Qatar situation with their neighbours a CIA ploy for us to steal back the 2022 World Cup? Uh, no. no. Francesco Zenteno, <laughs> is it good to see a team like AC Milan get their act together and is it beneficial for Italian football and European football? I would say yes. I'll cede the floor to you on that one. I, I, I just think if... We remember the great teams under Arrigo Sacchi and Capello. Really outstanding Milan teams. And why wouldn't we want to see Milan back at their best? It's kind of like the way people feel like Leeds United. They want to see them back at their best. They're, they don't even support the team. but I suppose, but has English football suffered? Probably. Oh, no. It's gone through the roof, if anything. All right, well. Oh, no. I mean... I but don't... you know what? But That may be English football, but Italian football maybe has. It probably needs a high-profile Milan. Yeah. I mean, at one point, they were the best team in the world. Not so long ago. No, not so long ago. Ben Martins, what does a successful 17-18 season look like for the Premier League top six if they do not win the title? Slash, can it be successful for some without the title? Of course. Mm. I think you're looking at second year Mourinho. They need a title challenge, if not a title win. Manchester City under pressure under Guardiola. Klopp in his second full season with Liverpool. A lot of pressure there to put a title run in. Whither Arsenal? I would say Liverpool and Arsenal specifically. Now, because of the money that Manchester United spent and because of Jose Mourinho's history as a second-year manager, the, the expectation for them will probably be title or bust. But uh, specifically, Liverpool and Arsenal, if they can, if they can be a top-four side, if they can play attractive, consi attractive, consistent football, something that maybe has people excited about the future, I would think most fans of those clubs could could walk away from this season pleased if they don't win a trophy, but but week in, week out are kind of a pleasure to watch. Okay. Spurs are in a gray area. How would you answer for them? Because they've been relatively close the last two years. Are they at a point now where they're, you know, now you've got the experience, you can't use excuses anymore. Is this a title or bust season that they're entering? It's, it's not bust, but I think there's huge pressure yeah. on them to, to... I think Tottenham can have a, su a successful season if they don't win the title in the in the league. 
Um, but obviously finish top four and have a successful Champions League campaign. Get out of the group, maybe quarterfinals. Uh, that's what I would look at. For I, I think with the progress that Pochettino has made, there will be Spurs fans who are really thinking, it's time, guys. It's time. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. It's, I yeah. don't know. Uh, email from Joaquin Santiago. This is an interesting one, which should be right up your alley, Andrew. Okay. Hey, guys, I wanted to get your opinions. I cannot stand any announcer we have here in the U.S. for soccer. They are all so awful. Maybe it's just that English is not a good language to announce soccer in. Or maybe it's just culture. But there is a lack of passion. In my home in Argentina, the announcers are so much better and more colorful. Am I missing something or is it just something I have to deal with? Has it gotten better in recent years? Maybe you two should get into announcing. You seem to care more about the games than these guys do. Wow. Uh, now, does he mean American announcers? Yeah, here in the U.S. Okay, well, I no, I, I, I cannot stand any announcer we have here in the U.S. in soccer. For um, soccer. Look, I, I personally am a a big John Strong guy. I think I do. He's think passionate. He's, I do think he's very good. Yeah, I mean, do we have to play the Michael Bradley clip again? Oh, <laughs> of his voice cracking. He's passionate. Um, I've always thought J.P. Della Camera was a, a very good announcer uh, in this country. Um, I think J.P.'s calls are great, and he's understated as well. He lets the pictures paint the story of the game, and he doesn't inter- in- inject himself into it. Now, look, I can't speak to if, if the guy who tweeted that, what was his name? If he's Joaquin Santiago. Well, if, he's, if Joaquin is talking, maybe he's not necessarily talking about those guys, but maybe if he's, maybe he's talking about on more of a local level, the you know MLS's individual announcers for each club. Um, well, he cites and I, um, El Polo Vinolo, who is a commentator in Argentina, and he gets very animated and he does the whole goal, that whole thing. I think, honestly, that, that thing does nothing for me. It, nothing for me. I think it's a stylistic thing. It's, it's stylistic it's, it's what you and cultural. Grew, it's what you grew up with as opposed to right. what other people grew up with and are accustomed to. If, if John Strong suddenly got on TV and Michael Bradley scored and he decided to scream goal for 30 seconds, people would say, what, what exactly are they you doing the right now? They'd turn the volume because right. they, it's not what's expected. Right. Also as well, Barry Davies is my favorite commentator of all time. And you know him from some great calls like, um, he's going to have a crack, you know? Is he going to have a oh, crack? Oh, yes! Yeah, yeah and, and he does his own passionate thing. And for the rest of the game, he'd be quite understated. But, and uh, You're describing Martin Tyler, who well, I think is maybe the best announcer in the history of the sport. But also, that's what I grew up with. So maybe if I grew up with this guy in Argentina, it'd be different. Right. I think it comes down to personal preference. I don't think it means that American announcers are bad. I think they're just different than what you're and By the way, to. when John Motson was the daddy of them all, some people hated his commentaries. <laughs> it, 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 it's very much a, a personal preference game. It's, it's a very tough game, as uh, Alexi Lalas and John Strong will tell you themselves. Yeah. Some people love him, some people hate him. Uh, Tony in San Jose, McGregor or Mayweather, who you got? Mayweather. Mayweather. With relative ease. Although I do plan, I said I was never going to do this again after Mayweather Pacquiao. I, I swore I would never buy another Mayweather fight. But something, I believe he'll win. I believe he'll win easily. But something about the wild card personality of Conor McGregor, I just don't want to, if he does something insane, uh, I just don't want to miss it. I think I think I'm going to buy that fight. If someone said to me, "I'll give you tickets for the uh, press conference," I'd be there in a flash, an absolute flash. I go to Vegas for that alone. It does have a feel of a sideshow attraction. And totally. by the way, if Conor McGregor wants to prove a point that he can box, why is he starting with uh, with this guy? Like, but it's not. He's proven. starting with the best. It's I mean, it's proving a bank balance. That's what it's that's doing. A good point. Travis yeah. Hall. Uh, we'll finish with a football one. Yep. Um, hey guys. I hate this, by the way. I've been dying to read it. I hate this. Okay. Want your thoughts on a rule change I would love to see implemented across soccer over my dead body. Nice. Let's hear it. So personally, I feel it is unfair, unfair to allow the team their choice of penalty kick taker as the foul was committed stopping a specific person. I would love to see soccer do what hockey does and have the person that is fouled take the penalty shot. Thoughts? You hate that? I hate this idea. Why? The idea of the penalty is to penalise the team that committed the foul. And to penalise them properly, you should be able to allow have anyone take the penalty kick. Of course. That's the idea. If, you, if, if John Terry's fouled and it's John Terry that's taking the kick, that's not, a, that's not a, the full punishment it deserves to be. I hate it. But maybe that would just cause more players. Like right now, 
a lot of these players feel no need to work on that or practice that. That's part what of their penalty game. kick competitions maybe, are for. Maybe now those guys would focus. That's more what on, penalty on kick competition, competitions are for. They're exposed Look, there. It's not. It's not a rule that I feel needs changing. But I wouldn't say that I hate that idea. It's I not, hate it's it. Not I a hate it. Thought. Ugh, I hate it. No. No. But you. But what? No. You, no. So, no, so, no, so no. you would change the rule in the NBA. So let's say you know some awful. Let's say uh, DeAndre Jordan gets fouled. Uh, you would say, well, the idea here is to punish the team that fouled him, so we're going to send Chris Paul to the free throw line. And do you and, think that's okay, Andrew? Do you remember the tactical fouling of Shaquille O'Neal? Hackershaw. It was just uh, yeah, no. That, it ruined. It, it was. It, it was silly. So I, you're saying actually that the NBA should adopt this, and it would actually help the sport. Oh yeah, very interesting. Oh yeah, absolutely. They fouled Shaq when he was on the ball, and yeah. they no. The other side to it is the fact that Shaq got to the level he got to and he couldn't pop a free throw was just mind-boggling. His hands were too big. He, he couldn't shoot. A, well, whatever. That's for another podcast. No, no. We said we ask us anything. That's what we did. Yeah. Well, there is that it? That's it. Oh, wow. That was a rousing, rousing I addition. hope people enjoyed that now. That was uh, – uh, I'm really – thank you, everybody, who sent in uh, sent in questions. Great stuff. And we'll th- do that from time to time. And thank you to the people who asked multiple questions or to the people I didn't get to. But, you know, we are on the clock here. So. Yes, we are. we got to hurry it up. Red card. Let me go first here. My first one, I, I have two quick ones. Uh, I referenced this on our podcast yesterday about the Confederations Cup. Yesterday we did good stuff. Today the bad. Russia's World Cup Stadium. So much attention has been paid – uh, to human rights abuses for the building of Qatar's World Cup facilities that maybe we've overlooked what's been going on in Russia. Human Rights Watch released a report on Wednesday saying that workers have faced repeated abuses and have gone unpaid for months in some cases. Some workers were forced to work in 13 degree below zero Fahrenheit temperatures without a sufficient break to warm themselves. Uh, more troubling than that is the report that 17 workers have died in the process of building these stadiums. Uh, The aforementioned Human Rights Watch says that Russia is not doing enough to eliminate these sorts of abuses, especially in relation to migrant workers, which is what we've heard a lot about in Qatar, Uh, specifically North Korean migrant workers in the case of Russia. Here's what FIFA had to say about this. Uh, Quote, FIFA is going beyond what any sports federation has done to date to identify and address issues related to human and labor rights. While incompliances with relevant labor standards continue to be found, something to be expected in a project of this scale, the overall message of exploitation on the construction sites portrayed by HRW, Human Rights Watch, does not correspond with FIFA's assessment. There's one line in there that's really jarring. The something to be expected in a project of this scale. What? That's not okay no. to excuse yourself. Now, look, that what they're saying in that line, maybe that's true, but you just look so small. And so bad coming out there and excusing this sort of behavior on any level that this that this should be expected. That's not good enough. Your FIFA, your the, the amount of money that FIFA has. It, it, we know all about the the corruption and the money that just is flowing freely, like like almost no other organization on earth. That's not okay. I mean, they have the resources where this stuff does not necessarily need to be going on. Don't be making excuses for yourself. I don't know of any major construction company that in their pitch. Now, guys, that's the design. This is how we're going to do it. You can't expect some people to die. Right. No. No. It's yeah. not good enough. Yeah. I'm no. Sure, I'm sure the families of those people that have died loved hearing FIFA just throw that line in their official statement. I mean, that, come on, guys. It was a, so tone deaf. And so, and so much corporate BS in that. Yeah. Uh, let me give you my second red card. I was not going to include this, and then I just happened to see this article tweet, and I said – You've got to be kidding me. Uh, Check Teote. His his body was flown back to the Ivory Coast. Um, here's the problem. There's an article here. This is from the BBC. Uh, here's the problem I have with it. The BBC, I'm reading now directly from the, the article. The BBC understands that Teote's family wants him to be buried in his hometown of uh, Yamu Sucro, but the Ivory Coast Football Federation prefers Abidjan. And there's more written here. Uh, message to the Ivory Coast Football Federation. This is not about you, all right? There should be no battle in this situation over where his final resting place is. If the family wants him in his original hometown, then that's it. End of story. How dare they think that they can come in and go against the family's wishes for his for where he'll be buried? 
and have the body where the football federation would prefer he be. Are you? This isn't about you. This is about the family. They just lost a 30 year old man. This has been a tr- the, the mo- of anybody associated with him. This has probably been the most traumatic experience of their life. And you're going to fight the family over something like this? Unbelievable. So petty and so wrong. I really hope. I, I'm gonna, so bizarre. I, I'd like to see how this plays out. I really, really hope that where he is finally buried is his hometown and the Ivory Coast Football Federation does not win here. And maybe they have a side to the story. I know there's a lot of people in the Ivory Coast that Chick Teote means an awful lot to and they probably feel a connection to him. But you know what? Your connection to him, does it? it it's microscopic. It pales in comparison to the connection he has to his actual family. Uh, I, I saw that and I thought it was so disgusting. I find it very weird. I hope there's another side to this because it's not laid out in the article as to what reason the Ivory Coast uh, Football Federation has that they want his body to be somewhere else aside from his hometown where his family wants it to be. So maybe there's more to it, um, and and maybe I haven't done enough research here, but in this article that I saw, that's how it was written, and I thought that was just terrible. It's very, very strange. Very, very strange. What do you have, my friend? Well, we talk about the dark arts, Andrew. I came across this today. Argentinian player poked opponent with needle during cup win. I saw this story. This is from RTE.ie. Yeah. I almost went with a hat trick of red cards when I saw this, but I thought that was too dark. An Argentine fourth division player is facing the sack after admitting that he poked an opponent with a needle during his team's shock cup win over top tier Estudiantes. Federico Allende, who plays for Sport Club Pacifico in the Federale B Championship, said his behaviour was inspired by former Argentine coach Carlos Biardo, who was reputed to have meted out similar treatment to opponents in his playing days. Allende was marking Estudiantes forward Juan Otero for most of the Copa Argentina match, which Sport won 3-2, and said that he nipped his rival several times. I had to turn to the great Biardo, Allende said in a radio interview. The poor guy, brackets Otero, did his head in. But what do you want me to do? Sorry, it did his head in. But what do you want me to do? We know we had to make the game dirty because top division players don't like it. He must have hated me, but that's football. Amazing. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, Otero it's not. confirmed he, he was poked four times and that he told the referee who took no action. I know it was the game of his life, but it is still just a football match, he said. However, Pacifico president Hector Moncada said Allende's behaviour has overshadowed his team's famous win and he would recommend sacking the player. That's we are shocked. It's put a dampener on the team's work, he said. Biardo, who himself was part of a highly successful Estudiantes team in the late 1960s, coached Argentina to World Cup victory in 86 and the runners-up spot four years later. Well, that's very much the right response from the club, so I, I give him credit for that. Again, By the way, where do you keep a needle during the course of a 90-minute match? I actually don't. I guess you carry it in the palm of your hand. but you're The ha- whole time? I guess you run with your fist closed. What, where else would you keep it? I have no idea. Think about it. Without damaging yourself. In your sock? No, I don't. I mean, I don't think soccer so. Soccer socks aren't even that thick anymore. I guess maybe on your shoelace, if you just kind of like needle, like right. needle it through your shoelace of some, said, and then pull it out every once yeah, in a while. Yeah, but I mean, I, I don't know, man. That's crazy. It would be hilarious if he did keep it in the shoelace, and your man scored a hat trick every time he tried to go and bend over and take it out. I mean, it's got to be somewhere accessible. That's a very weird story, and I hope that uh, I hope he is punished justifiably. By for the way, that. throwing the coach, a World Cup winning coach, under the bus. <laughs> Yeah, part of the game. Good Lord. Caught offside's man of the match. I will go first here. I went with American television audiences. Sunday night's USA-Mexico match was the most watched World Cup qualifier in the history of Fox Sports 1. They peaked at 2.8 million viewers from about 10 o'clock to 10.15 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Averaged a little over 2 million throughout. Meanwhile, American Spanish language network Univision announced this week that they had an average viewing audience of 4.5 million. By the way... This is interesting because it was the same night that the Stanley Cup final was decided, Game 6, and that was on NBC, not NBCSN, but NBC's regular network, an average of 7 million watched that game. So when you combine networks of who was watching USA-Mexico versus the Stanley Cup final, it was basically a wash, 7 million to about 6.6 million. Uh, so pretty even. On the, again, on the night where the Stanley Cup trophy was awarded, um, you know, I'm not a guy who pits sports against one another. Like I said during but the mailbag, bigger than hockey. But like I said during the mailbag, I watch them all. But it's again small signs over the course of, of this sport in this country's growth that you're seeing, and I think you have to look at that one as a, as another positive sign for soccer. Speaking of growth. My man of the match is club of the match, the U.S. Open Cup. Congrats to Cincinnati, who knocked out Columbus Crew. 
And well done to Miami FC of the NASL, which I know you hate that division, who easily dispatched <laughs> Orlando City 3-1. Um, but the real story, Andrew, is that of the last remaining amateur side in this season's Open Cup. Uh, they played on Tuesday night. Christos FC from Baltimore, Maryland. A bunch of journeymen, former semi-pro college players who don't train and only know of their lineup prior to kickoff, depending on who can get off work to play. They've been aptly called a beer league team um, named after and sponsored by a liquor store uh, well Andrew after beating pro team Richmond Kickers in round 1 then defeating Chicago United 1-0 they took on four time MLS Cup champions DC United on Tuesday night they lost 4-1 to the full time pro side but they did give quite a moment to a packed Maryland soccerplex on Tuesday night here is the moment when Mamadou Kanase's free kick found the top corner and the place went nuts <laughs> It was a really, really cool scene. I mean, they're playing in a park, essentially. There's people just Grass on a, banks. Yeah, people just on a little bit of a Great a crowd, hill. though, right? Oh, yeah, a very good crowd. That, They'll never see it. DC United were playing a game of consequence at this little park. It was incredible to see. And, you, by the way, that goal, it put them in front. They right. went up 1-0. Yeah. It was 1-1 into the 80th minute. And in reading about the game... They just ran out of gas. I, their fatigue up against that of a professional soccer team—they started cramping. They couldn't keep. They just couldn't keep up. And the final ten minutes, they just broke down and they gave up three goals. But it was one-one. Christos FC, a liquor store team, right up against DC United. Amazing! What a story. Yeah. And, and it it speaks to something else out there that people don't talk about. And I'll just talk about it quickly because. You see it in the Cosmopolitan League in New York, and you see it down in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Andrew, the amount of guys who played at high school level or college level who are really good, who keep playing into their 20s because they love the sport, that's a victory for them right there. The idea that we just have MLS or NASL and the U.S. national team. No, we've got some really good amateur players, and you can go see them play across this country in many different cities. And you know what? They stack up very well with any player I've played against back home. There's a couple other good stories out there. Um, the round of 16, the, the matchups have all been announced, mostly MLS, but you do have Miami FC, who are going to be taking on Atlanta United. You have the Chicago Fire, who will be playing FC Cincinnati, who upset Columbus in incredible scenes there where they had uh, over 30,000 on hand for that game, a packed house for uh, FC Cincinnati. And you have the Galaxy will be visited by Sacramento Republic. Hmm. Um, but both Miami FC and FC Cincinnati have home games against MLS sides that should be really fun to see. The uh, only reason so I didn't big them up too much is that Miami FC are managed by uh, you know Alessandro Nesta. They've got they've got Poku, uh, they've got uh, Richie Ryan. These are good US soccer players who are professionals. And Orlando, it was Orlando City, right? They yeah. just didn't play a, an A squad. Oh, it doesn't matter. They bet them three one. Right, and it was three nil at one point. Yeah. Um, so no, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, the Christos FC even in defeat was probably the story of this round of the U.S. Open Cup. But um, this is why this is when this tournament can be fun. Now, when the, you start seeing stuff like this. Now, I'll tell you something. For my money, they need to do more to promote an MLS and U.S. soccer. I have to take a more active part in the Malar, in the Lamar Hunt Open Cup and and just really push it like it's our FA Cup. Also, it's not some like. Fabric. It's not something that was just created because we felt like we needed to emulate what they're doing. And it's this tournament is 103 years old, I believe. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been around forever. It's so yeah, this is this is more authentic than MLS even. It absolutely is. And go and read Nick Ellerson's uh, Washington Post piece on Christos. It's really really good and gives you a flavor of uh, well, basically what it's like to have your headquarters of your team being a liquor store. Wow. Pretty cool. Pretty cool scenes indeed. So there you go. Great show. Thanks to everybody again who chimed in for our mailbag and special. And keep it coming. We love to interact with you guys. That's the whole point. That's why we're different from other people. Because <laughs> we love the general public. Actually, I do. You don't. I, that, is, you uh, that is a lie perpetuated you by, the, by the media. <laughs> and I won't have it. So there you go. Good stuff, my friend. I hope you have a very nice Father's Day weekend. I hope you do too. What, what, what's your plans? I'm going to be in Avalon, New Jersey. Beautiful. Oh, God. Down near Cape May. Gorgeous. Yep. I'll be with the family. It should be a great time for all of us.
By the way, um, yeah. your your long overdue birthday present is now be going to become a, a Father's Day gift. I had forgotten about it. Yeah, I ha- I'm not offended. I don't care. You don't have to get me. No, anything. no, no, no. You got me something. And I'm did going you spend to reveal more than it on here. on this? Uh, no. All right, good. No, I did not. But it's You're, still you, awesome. I'm I, I'm sure it is. I'm very excited about it. It was very nice of you to do it. And I'm a that, nice guy. That, you are a very nice guy. On that note, we say. See you later, fun boy. See you later. Take care. <laughs> You've been listening to the Caught Offside Soccer Podcast. 